Hello everybody, this is Zoe Elton, Director of Programming for Mill Valley Film Festival and I am thrilled to have a great group of guests here today to talk about a wonderful film, Thousand Pieces of Gold. Uh, we have with us, um, in, on one screen, we have Nancy Kelly, the director, Kenji Yamamoto, who edited the film. Uh, we have Rosalind Chow, who plays Lalu, also known as Polly, and Chris Cooper, who played Charlie. So welcome everybody. Thank you so much for being with us here today for Rafael at Home. And, um, you know, and for having this chance to see Thousand Pieces of Gold and to be with you and hear a little bit about this film. You know, I kind of feel like it's, um, Chris was just saying right before we went on, on screen that, uh, that having these kinds of screenings at Rafael at Home is like, being pioneers for change, but I almost feel like the film itself was kind of pioneering for change in, in many ways, you know? It's, um, the story itself is incredibly timeless, but, um, you know, it was sort of pioneering in as much as, you know, it's the story of a woman who persists, it's about racism in America, it's about what we'd now call the Me Too movement, uh, it's about slavery, it's about romance, it's about so many things. So Nancy and Kenji, what were the things that first made you want to tell this story? I mean, I mean, I know this is going back, so for context, this is over 30 years ago now, but what was yep. the spark that brought you to it? I, I saw the novel when I was um, touring with Cowgirls. I was in Sun Valley, Idaho, and looking for something to read during a long layover. And I, I picked it up and it was like, wow, Chinese women in the West, what's that all about? And, but, and I read, within a couple of hours, I had read the novel and said, oh, I want to make this into a narrative feature. <laughs> and then oh Nancy God. called me from the airport and I, I read the novel when she came home and I said, wow, this is a story about immigration, but it's also a story about two people who are from outside of the, the small community, um, both Lalu and Charlie, and somehow they shared this, this, this feeling about being outside. And I thought that that would make it a stronger immigration story. So it was something to actually see that element in there. And it also really made um, Kenji you know, his parents were interned during World War II and, and it's really connected with his and his family's mm -hmm. experiences with racism. And mm. you know, you didn't see much about that in the movies. Yes. Then. Oh. That's so true. So uh, Rosalind, was that one of the things about this story that, that connected you to it? And what was it, uh, you know, what appealed to you about the script when you first read it? Well, what didn't appeal to me about that? <laughs> right. <laughs> it, was really, I mean, role, right? it was like being handed a piece of gold. I mean, honestly, this is something that I, I had been very curious about Americans, uh, Asian Americans, well, the first um, Asians who came to America, because when I was growing up, we didn't get to learn about uh, Chinese in America except for other than one page in a history book, you know? So I remember doing some research about it and being a little bit obsessed with the gold rush and um, the Chinese coming over and helping to build the railroads. And so when this script came, it, it did seem like a godsend. It was, I mean, it, it's a story of a strong, the first Asian American pioneer woman, um, outsiders finding each other um you know it just had everything in it there was nothing missing mm. and, and just to follow up on that because this is actually based on a true story right i mean did you do research and look into her backstory and what did you find yeah we did and and nancy actually was wonderful about sending me um information you know i was not as experienced as I wish I had been <laughs> before we started filming. And Nancy sent me a lot of um, information, not just about Lalu, and it wasn't, you know, about 
mimicking uh, Polly Bemis in any way. It was more about the spirit of a survivor. Mm -hmm. And I think that was the title of one of the books that Nancy sent me, um, The Spirit of a Survivor by Gail Sheehy. Um, and that feeling, we talked at great length about being an outsider and looking for someone that's like you, uh, you know, in spirit or in form. And, um, you know, she was very helpful. Mm. I, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, I think one of the things that we've come to realize with time is how important it is to see images of ourself on screen. Um, so Chris, I'm, I'm wondering, you know, what appealed to you about the character of Charlie? And, you know, was there something about him that resonated for you with who you are? Uh, you know, I, this was one of the, uh, one of the first few uh, pieces of film work I had done. I had done, you know, 12, 15 years of theater before that. So all I can say to pat myself on the back was that I think I can, I think I can tell a good script when I read one. Mm -hmm. And um, this was timely story um and uh oh god what was the word you used uh, accessible. yeah accessible um had great research on putting putting trying to put charlie together with the with the background of civil war history mm -hmm. and imprisonment camps um i can't remember the name of the of the uh, prison that I read Anderson. about, Andersonville, mm -hmm. it was Andersonville, and um, uh, the PTSD aspect of it, and mm -hmm. that incorporate that kind of rolled over into his drinking habit and his mm -hmm. gambling, and um, it just uh, looked to me like something I was very eager to to a character I was eager to tackle. Yeah. Yeah, and you mentioned the drinking. I mean, obviously it's quite a big part of Charlie's character. And, and I understand that you weren't a drinker at that point, but I, the rumor is that you went out in the evenings with some of the, um, <laughs> with some of the art department um, to uh, perhaps uh, check in with that aspect. On occasion. <laughs> on, a, on, a, on a free night, yeah. I think we all... Um, how did the research go, Chris? <laughs> <laughs> I think you learned something. We had, we, I, I can remember, there was one particular night where we were really celebrating. <laughs> well. And there were some, there were some Montana cowgirls up at the bar <laughs> that, man, they were, they were aggressively scary. <laughs> Let's just say, I wish I had a camera. I wish there were iPhones back then, because I would have so many blackmail. <laughs> I can say. We no, were, we were good. We, we were good. good. But we did do a lot of, you know, like now when I work, I wouldn't, I, I'm such a good girl. I don't touch booze while I'm working. But then we were doing tequila tequila oh, shots yeah. the night before early calls what were we thinking my only consolation my only consolation is I, I say i had done my homework before i came to set so i was <laughs> for anything you know what chris uh, what happens in montana stays in montana i i think that's how that works <laughs> <laughs> oh god it was a really fun town to be in too i mean Yes. You know. It was oh yeah, I mean it, that was that was that was Ennis, and it was primarily, I think, probably known for hunting and fishing, trout fishing. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And, um, but um, you know, I mean, shooting the film, we had we probably did 12, 12 14 hour days anyway. Not much to do after the shoot, but. Um, <laughs> You know, we found ways of entertaining ourselves in this little, way out in the middle of nowhere town. But um, at I that, at that early age, to do research. <laughs> <laughs> well, we also 
jo- saw dailies every night. That was the only shoot right. I've been on where we actually went to see. And, you know, I remember seeing the first time seeing Chris, because I remember when our first day shooting thinking, don't get mad at me, Chris. But the first day, I just thought, wow, he's really subtle. He doesn't, you know, I, this will be interesting. The first day of dailies, I thought, oh my God, this guy is amazing. Amazing. Oh, sweetheart. Yes, I'm thank here. you. Thanks. Yeah, those those first early days of watching dailies was um, seemed pretty momentous and pretty pretty um, pretty scary. But um, <laughs> I think we could tell that after a little while, things were kind of working okay. You know, Nancy, what were you shooting on if you were watching dailies? Oh, thirty-five millimeter. We, I, I, mean, I assumed you were shooting on thirty-five, but it's like. So wait a minute. So was there a was there a lab in Montana? There must have no, been. No, no. We we Seattle. had we had to oh. uh, ship the uh, uh, the dailies to Seattle every day, and we had a runner. And um, so it wasn't truly dailies. It was a uh, day the, after. The, the, we call it the day afters. But 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 at that point, you knew a lot about the day after. It sounds like to me. Right, right. And uh, <laughs> we had to also ship the projector because the movie theater that was there in town. Uh, was not operating, so the, there was the, the, the building and the seats, but there was no projector. So we actually had to ship a movie projector from San Francisco and Delta, they, they complained that they had to take off the, the, the door in order for the projector to, to get into the cargo area, because they use a passenger airplane, apparently. <laughs> wow. Well, you know, we really had to fight American Playhouse, um, our main financier. Um, they were up for Super 16, but not 35. But Kenji's edit machine was 35, so we were able to convince them that. It, That's you know, amazing. That's actually yeah. amazing. And I, and it, it, I mean, in a way that answers a lot of questions for me. I sort of assumed it was on 35, and that, you know, seeing it again last year. Um, you know, it's so beautifully shot and mm-hmm. it really reminded me also of what it was to be an American independent filmmaker 30 years ago, what it is now. Um, and I think one of the things, you know, it's as much as this is an incredibly timeless story, one of the things that really struck me was, um, you know, how few American indies now actually attempt period dramas, you know, and if they do, they're not necessarily that successful. I mean, you know, exceptions, of course, like Kelly Reichardt, you know, you know, another woman, just saying. Um, mm-hmm. But um, it's so beautifully composed. And Nancy, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about it. I mean, I feel like there's a classic Western look to it, but there's there are these beautiful places where you have this really expansive landscape and there'll be one person on it. And there were points in looking at the film, I thought, this has been, composed in a way that is so smart because i'm assuming that there were you know you you didn't have the biggest budget in the world necessarily but i feel like you made incredible choices in the way that you created a frame well you know bobby bukowski the director of photography who chris just worked with like last year right um my last my last job yeah yeah. worked with bobby which film was that it's a you know john stewart had a political uh Siri on TV, uh, uh, what the heck was it called? Um, and so he, uh, political comedy, uh, wrote and directed it with uh, Steve Carell kind of headlining. Oh, wow. This one. <laughs> and that's coming out later at the end of, uh, later this year. What we, we never the really know this year when things are actually going to come out. Right. <laughs> it's yeah. like, yes. yeah. I keep thinking of that how to make God laugh, tell him your plans thing, right. you know, as we yeah. go through this year. Right. Um, you I also, know, I, I, go ahead. I had a whole bunch of like photographs of Flemish paintings. Kenji and I, he had sort of introduced me to that. And, um, and then I'd been really inspired by um, McCabe and Mrs. Miller. Mm. Um, and all the directors of photography that I interviewed 
um, would just kind of look at me and go, you can't shoot this film on your budget. And the only person who actually said to me, how do you want to shoot this scene? Because the scene that they all like was sort of the breaking point for everybody was the scene where Lalu walks through the, um, the saloon at night and with the, um, with the kerosene lantern in her, in her hand and she finds the knife. And that was the one that they just, you know, it's like, you can't do that. And, um, and, but Bobby was just like, how do you want to do that? And I described, because I, I didn't care about the background. I just cared about her face, you know? Mm, mm, and, and he was like, oh, I can do that. But then last year he came to um, a screening of Thousand Pieces of Gold at the Museum of the Moving Image in New York. And, um, and I, that somebody asked a similar question and I, I talked about that and Bobby stood up and said, I just wanted the job. I didn't know if I could do that. <laughs> <laughs> Wow, wow, wow. Well, he was very clever in, in, in using uh, the source light of the lamp, like the lanterns, and that he um, did some research and he discovered that there were high intensity light bulbs that were manufactured in Germany. And so with a camera belt that Rosalind wore, right. he wired her up so there was a little bright lamp inside the kerosene lamp. So that would be the source of Wow. Of light and uh, right. but the idea of, of of making it look like the candle or the kerosene lamp being the source was very important to both of us and to Bobby himself too. He, that we just yeah. wanted that flickering, you know, yes. like um, and it was so. Yeah, yep, yep. So I want to just pause a minute because um, people who are um, with us remotely. Um, there is a Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. So if you have a question that you'd like to send over, please do. And we have one that's come in from Lisa Baggs, who says, I realize the film is partially based on a true story, but wonder if either at the time the film was made or in retrospect, anyone had concerns about perpetuating the white male savior trope or having only negative behavior by Japanese men in the film. Japanese men, there's no... Is there a Japanese man in there that there I didn't not. know? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to edit that question and say, by Chinese men in the film. <laughs> Sorry, I was just reading. <laughs> yeah, you're taking a couple of leaks, a couple of decades worth of leaps there. Um, white savior, I know it's an important and, and highly discussed um, thing going on in film right now and in and rightfully so but i dare say back then uh we have a woman lead in this film who's very strong and wins her independence through fighting and uh i think we'll as we go along we'll we'll deal with this in little steps are great steps down the road, but back then, uh, I don't know if that was the huge concern it is now. Also, I, I feel like um, I was the yellow savior um, to Charlie. So I didn't really see it that Charlie was the white savior at all. Um, but I, I understand that that- Charlie was pretty lost himself, you know. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, yeah. when we were trying to raise the money for this, I remember having this meeting at an independent distributor who shall remain nameless. Um, and the, the producer there said to me, um, he had read the script and invited me to come in. And he said, you know, if it, this girl meets boy, you know, I could see it if it was boy meets girl. You know, I mean, that's where it would have been, um, yeah. you know. I think that's interesting, Nancy. We, we showed um, The Wife, the film that Glenn Close was in a couple of years ago at the theater. Um, and when they took that script out um, to male men actors to be the husband, essentially, um, it was rejected frequently because um, agents did not want their actors playing, you know, the second fiddle to the wife. Exactly. You, uh, you know, so that's now. So I think you bring up a, a really interesting point in that terms of- changed in all these years. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that has not changed? No. Yeah. That yeah, whole yeah. packaging thing, that's, you know. Yeah. That's, um, 
without American Playhouse and their dedication to having things be different than that, right? Having yeah. that in the lead, having an Asian woman in the lead. Um, right. We, yeah. I don't know how we would have gotten this film made. Uh, it's very, it would have been very, I mean, you know, you really were pioneers in that way. I mean, I'm just coming back to that word, but. Um, I know these, I know this, uh, this, I knew this question was coming. <laughs> and I would love to know, uh, back to the, back to the, um, the uh, person who uh, initiated the question, I hope we answered your question from decades ago. That's a, that's a good love thing. To hear a I would yeah, love um, to hear a response. You, um, you may get a response from her, but there's a follow-up question from Kelly Tony, who says, uh, that they were a little concerned, um, a little concerned about the white, sa the quote unquote, white savior in the beginning too, until I got invested in the film and saw that Lalu was the key consistently strong character with unwavering determination. It was very inspiring. Mm -hmm. That this person found an initial bias uh, and that, that removed and removed that to see the true value in the story. So that's more of a comment than a question, but it's an mm -hmm. observation that I think confirms what each of you has said in terms of, you know, how, you know, things have changed over time. Right. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, that it was very radical to have, um, uh, you know, a, a Chinese character driving an American independent film. I mean, mm -hmm. was there anything before that? I don't know. No, uh, and really like Lalu, I mean, Nancy and Kenji, they were like Lalu in that they just, I've never seen any, anybody so determined to get this thing done, come hell or, come snow, come rain, come stampede. I mean, didn't at one point filming got held up because there was a stampede of or cows crossing, we couldn't get to location or something. I mean, and they drove, they drove the film truck out. That, I mean, that's, when we talk about the budget, I don't think I've ever been in a movie with such a low budget before. Have you, Chris? I mean, that's the lowest I've been budget. in a, a handful of really low budgets and, and, I, and I have no regrets. I, I, I am so thrilled with, to see the finished product and what what directors and 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 cinematographers were, were able to pull off with a such a limited budget, it was astounding. Mm. Well, that also connects with another um, attendee who has the question for Nancy: Was it hard for Nancy to get the film financed as a female director of a western? Um, also, just wanted to say how beautiful the film and the acting is. Can I just say many thumbs up on that? And yeah. thanks to the Rafael for giving this person the opportunity to watch it. Yeah. So thank you, anonymous attendee. Thanks for the Rafael. So Nancy, talk about the financing and particularly for you as a female director of a Western. First of all, I never thought of it as a Western. I thought of it as a, um, as a female driven story of empowerment. Yeah. You know, I just, yes, it had horses, but you know, like 10 years before we made the film, I was making my living riding horses as a cowgirl. So to me, it was just, I just didn't think of it as a Western. If people, it's a Western, that's how people see it. So mm -hmm. but it, it wasn't that, it was um, that I was, female, I didn't have very much experience. I had only made a couple of documentary shorts at that point. Mm. And mm. there was a producer, an independent producer here in the Bay Area, um, Rachel Lyon. Do you remember her from Tell Me a Riddle? Yeah, and yeah. she was one of the godmothers. She was one of the godmothers and she yeah. was our godmother. And she just said to us, if Nancy's gonna direct, you're gonna have to raise the money because if the producers right. choose the director and you're gonna have to be the producers. And really we raised, everything except um, the last $100,000 mm -hmm. Rachel brought in. But, um, but yes. that's how I got to be the director, was we raised the money. Before there was uh, crowdfunding, we did real crowdfunding. <laughs> we went to the crowds. <laughs> we, what do you mean? 
we, we would uh, have investment parties and we would meet individual investors and um, we developed the screenplay uh, through investor involvement and then we that was how we were able to hire our screenwriter and make peace and um, uh, afford the various uh, messengers and and uh, office expenses we we bought a fax machine <laughs> <laughs> an essential tool <laughs> and uh, uh, and uh, we traveled and uh, pitched the film and went to American Playhouse in New York City and and then we went to uh, Hong Kong and uh, we found some partners there and uh, we raised all the money that's what it takes uh, mm -hmm. uh, to meet people and I think people saw that we as filmmakers were honest and uh, we were going to um, give them something that they would really be very proud of. And so but there was this one, you know, those years. investment parties. I mean, we were, I would go and I would buy the cheapest, most horrible tasting wine ever. <laughs> Great, right? I learned that you were supposed to cut the grapes so that people could just take like little bunches of them. So they weren't just like sitting there like, <laughs> in a pile. And, and I remember once we were supposed to have like 10 people come, one person came. Ooh. And we um, stood there, we gave our spiel like we always yes. did. We were, we were dressed she, in suits and a nice dress. Right. And she came in with her jeans right. and, and a sweater. And a briefcase, but she had a briefcase. <laughs> and when she walked out, she said, I'm in for $50,000. Yes. Wow. <laughs> the guy whose car was stolen during the investment party, he didn't invest. Wow. Amazing. Amazing. Can't you try really hard to get him to invest, but he didn't. <laughs> yes. That's great. I know it was, it was also it was great to see Jennifer McCready's name in your credits. Oh, oh yes. yeah. You know, I mean, she's been like a supporter of all of us yes. for yes. forever, forever. Yes. Um, we have a question here from Wendy Callens um, for Chris and Rosalind. Um, Neither of you were big stars when you made this movie. How did the movie shape your careers? Chris. <laughs> Who's on first? Okay, I'll go first. I, you know what? It was a win. It was the. Um, I think I was I, the reason I got up for the role is um, uh, Laura Kennedy uh, saw me in a play at the taper. So um, otherwise, I don't even know if I would have been considered for this part. Um, but then uh, I, it, it did. I remember. Um, after that, I think Wayne had seen it um, before mm -hmm. casting Joy Luck Club. And, mm -hmm. you know, I, I think it was a, you know, pretty good calling card. Laura Kennedy is our casting director. And okay. yes. he also said, Chris Cooper is Charlie. That was her first words. That's great. <laughs> it's brilliant. That's so great. Wow. It was really so Your turn, Chris. Um, you know, when you, when you, honestly, when you ask that, ask a question like that of me, how did it shape my career? I, th I feel as though I'm the worst person to ask, <laughs> have asked, you know, to ask that question to. I have no idea what <laughs> came of, of, of having done thousand pieces of gold but um i knew i knew it was the right thing to do you know for 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 my career for what i was going after for what I, the material that I, the kind of material that i was looking for mm -hmm. the kind of material that before i became an actor and watched other actors who impressed me and it was a very limited number of actors who impressed me um, I knew this was, uh, I felt like this was, um, the route to take. It's interesting. You know, I was thinking about Chris, uh, you know, you were in Little Women last year as you playing Mr. Lawrence. And I was thinking, you know, 
as well as, you know, having been, you know, directed by two very talented women directors, um, you know, there was something about those two characters, Mr. Lawrence in Little Women and Charlie, um, that they're both principled people. They're both men of principle in the same way that Lalu is also, um, you, know, a, you know, they're both really driven by principle. Mm -hmm. and I, I just, you know, just, just noticing that, you know, I've, you know, it's like Charlie won't, you know, going out the gate, he says he won't support slavery. I mean, it's radical to hear that, you know. Um, but I wonder for all of you, you know, are you, is that the kind of storytelling that you seek out either in your work or in, um, or in, you know, things that you binge watch or read or whatever, um, you know, things where it's really driven by a character who's very principled. And, and Nancy and Kenji, you know, I'm thinking of, you know, I mean, you've gone into documentary filmmaking coming out of this, but something like Rebels, you know, with a cause, you know, a lot of the work is about people who are driven by principle. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any thoughts on that? Well, um, if, 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 okay. Um, I have said time and time again, uh, I have been stamped and very happily with the um, stamp of, uh, well, he's a character actor. Mm. And that's fine with me. I would find nothing more boring than playing the same character over and over and over again. And some of the characters that I've played in my career have been despicable. Yeah. But sometimes I've had the most fun with those, with those characters. Um, but on, but on, when a script like this comes your way, um, I don't know. I don't know what to say other than you just. It's 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 such a something you want to. You just want to go after. You know? mm -hmm. I think the the whole idea is when we're. I I can't speak for you, Chris, but at the same time, I I feel like sometimes. If something um, connects with you, even if you're playing somebody, I mean, I played horrible people. I mean, I was a murderess in my last film, but yet you can f you can find that piece of yourself that um, connects mm -hmm. to the character. Mm -hmm. And um, in Thousand Pieces of Gold, I, I felt like there was, you know, I'm not saying I'm as strong as Lalu or as you know, much of a pioneer, but at the same time, I think there, you, we found something in these characters that we could just, um, that we could hang our hat on and, you know, um, yeah. at the, although I'd rather play her now, to be honest, because mm -hmm. <laughs> I feel like, you know, Talk when about you're, that. yeah, well, when you're young, I mean, I hadn't really had much life experience, I don't think, yeah. then as much as you can read about it. I mean, don't you feel that sometimes, Chris, like you wish Absolutely. that things... I, you know, when, when I saw this, uh, this was, this gathering was coming up, um, we, I, we went on Netflix or wherever it is and we pulled it and I watched, um, it wasn't the restored version. It wasn't the restored clip, oh, um, yeah. but, but <laughs> still um, watched it. <laughs> five, four or five days, four or five nights ago. And um, uh, it's pretty honorable work. I don't know, I don't know what. Yeah, yeah, it really is. Yeah. So uh, I, I, that's, I haven't really, I haven't rewatched it um, yet. I will, I will. I'm scared too. When you're ready. Oh, I was very, I was, I was. Link to the restored version, Chris. <laughs> no, I was really scared to watch it too, um, we, Roslyn. Yeah, I, cause, cause we were, yeah, I mean, I. I yeah, but, 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 but I was saying, as I, as I watched it, you know, and, and, yeah. and, and what, what Rosalind was saying, I watched it and, and there were some scenes where I said, oh man, I, I, I'd play that differently now. <laughs> You know, we when we did the the colorizing because we did all the colorizing again um, it, as part of the restoration process, and there's that scene um, where 
while Lou has the knife stuck into her stomach and and you're trying to talk <laughs> Han King out of um out of using her as a prostitute mm -hmm. and there like every nanosecond it seemed like you were just changing I mean I, I hope that's not what yeah. really you saw and thought I wish I could do that over because that has blown me away so much no, I mean, yeah, no, no. Overall, I was still, I was very pleased. It still works. It really works very well, you know, uh, ju just having seen it a couple of nights ago. Um, but it's just the thing. All actors. All, all, it happens with actors. I mean, it's as fresh as today. I, 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 oh, I remember that scene and... Mm, I'd make yeah. some adjustments. Yeah. You know. I redirected the whole film when we were. Yeah. It. yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it is. It, it feels like an incredible. I held her back. <laughs> <laughs> it feels like an incredibly <laughs> time. The, the reshoot. To you, Rosalind, um, you are playing that role now, as it's <laughs> now being re-released in now I think in thirty <laughs> venues across the nation. So. Uh, you are now in the present. <laughs> well, I, to be honest, I don't really watch myself in anything. So it's not I, that, it's that, you I know, understand. it's just um, my. I understand. Yeah. But the beauty okay. of it is, it's such a, you know, it's such a universal story and it's, it still holds, it still holds true and um, really proud to be a part of it. <laughs> Hey, you sold me. I'm going to watch this one again. Okay. Yeah, you should. You should. I'll send you a um, link. And I feel like that's a great moment to end with. However, we do have one last question, um, which is, who owned the little town where you filmed? <laughs> what was it called? <laughs> oh, there was this wacky guy in Montana, and he was a congressman or something, but yes. he was all, his name was Charles Bobie. He was also an heir to the General Mills fortune. And he just had this thing where he would hear about a gold rush building that was going to be torn down anywhere in the West. And he would like bring a crew, they would number the logs, they dis disassemble it, drive it back to the little town, Nevada City, and then put it back together. Wow. And it, it was supposed to be a, a, a tourist attraction, like uh, he, he dreamt of a, a Disneyland, but in Montana. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. And I'll just and, uh, I'll just throw in I'll just throw in a handful of years later. I did this mini mini series called uh, Lonesome Dove, oh, yeah. and we did a uh, another series Return to Lonesome Dove, and we used that location um, again. Wow. Oh, wow! Wow! The same town? Huh? The same town? Same town. Yeah. Yeah, wow. same buildings, same buildings. So for, so for all the film geeks out there, you now have something to go and look at. You can go look at Thousand Pieces of Gold again, and then you can see if you can see this. Oh, yeah. <laughs> right. and, and the great thing about that place was that unlike a lot of places that we look at, it's on a paved highway. <laughs> you don't have to like right. take a snowmobile to get there, you know, so right. yeah. Well, and even the parkland that we shot at was, um, do you remember this, Chris? It was, for, it was on the market for $100,000. Mm -hmm. And I was trying to talk you and um, I think Bobby into coming in with me to buy it. Don't you wish you listened to me back then? <laughs> no, no kidding. No kidding. No. <laughs> Well, well no, re no regrets, right? No regrets. Yes. <laughs> um, but thank you all so much for being with us here tonight at Rafael at Home. And um, thank you all for making the film and for restoring it, Nancy and Kenji. I mean, it looks so gorgeous in the restoration. Thank yeah. you. you know, yeah. It's a timeless, beautiful piece of work that still resonates with things that are very close to all of our hearts, I think. So thank you very much for your work then. Thank you for your work, your work now. And thank you for being with us tonight. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so I'm much. gonna watch it tonight. <laughs> no, I'm